We become what we practice. When I want to change my life, lose weight, work out, read the Bible and pray more often, I don't make much progress until I change my habits. Good thoughts and New Year's resolutions don't last without a plan. Jen Pollock Michelle offers eight habits for reimagining productivity, resisting hurry, and practicing peace in her latest book, In Good Time, published by Baker. She invites us to seek wisdom that is more concerned with ethical practice than type A respectability. She helps us recognize that we detest waiting because we have to believe that God is acting when we are not. But since we live according to God's sovereign plan, we have every reason for hope in all circumstances. Jen writes this, If you only live once, your hope lasts only as long as this life. But if your life can be incorporated into the God who makes all things new, if you can hold to the vision of Revelation 21, of a world from which mourning and pain have passed away, you have time for hope. Now, I love that from Jen. You have time for hope. That's significant because Jen observes that time has replaced place as the primary context for modern life. And so I'm eager to talk with Jen about this book. But first, I'm going to surprise her. I want to share another reason I'm inviting Jen on this podcast. She doesn't know I'm going to do this. But in 2019, I stood at a crossroads. I didn't know whether to focus more on writing books or start a podcast. She recommended a podcast. And here we are, episode 100 of Gospel Bound. More than 4 million downloads and counting. So to mark the occasion, I want to invite Jen to join the podcast. So thank you, Jen, for giving me the nudge that helped convince me to start Gospel Bound. Oh, my goodness. That's really great news. Congratulations <laughs> on 100 episodes. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Jen. So let's, let's talk about it in good time and these eight habits. Okay. So was this a book that you planned before the pandemic and adjusted in light of those conditions or did it arise from the particular challenges of COVID-19? That's a great question. I had a contracted a contract for a book um, prior to the pandemic. I wasn't exactly sure what that book would be about. Um, I think I was circling around these ideas. I also kind of wondered if it was a book about calling. I mean, I had a couple of different outlines, but certainly once the pandemic came, um, arrived, um, you know, and then it, then it was just delay, 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 because it was hard to get work done. It was hard to really just decide truthfully. And finally I decided, okay, it's about time. It's going to be about these. It's going to be a habit structure. And yeah, but it took me a long time to land there. It seems like, Jen, no matter what, for all of us, that pandemic is going to be a turning point in our lives. Yeah. Let me give us a little bit more background on how that um, that that experience has been a turning point for you and your family. For sure. I mean, I was one of those people that, I mean, I've been a lifelong reader of time management books. And I talked about that in the, um, in, in good time. And so when time was such a weird thing in the pandemic, the first thing I did was kind of like go back to my time management books. Like, um, surely there's something more that I have to learn. Um, maybe there are ways that I can get more productive and feel better in this global crisis. And, you know, I started to read new pandemic, pan new productivity books. And I think it was just, you know, it was two, two months in that I just realized like, this is not the answer. I have a lot of time anxiety, but I don't think productivity is actually answering the essential question here. And maybe there are just, there's an invitation to learn to live differently in time. And so that's what started to happen for me. And the cool thing is, is that I was keeping a very meticulous journal of the pandemic. So early in the pandemic, if you remember, you know, people were saying, keep a, keep a record, keep a plague journal. And I was one of those people who thought, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Like, I think it's really important to remember things. And as a writer, I like to keep a record of things. So I started to do that. And it was really just in reflecting on that pandemic journal that I realized how things really started to shift for me from productivity to just a way of just starting to receive life with a lot more gratitude and a lot more surrendered trust, I would say. Hmm. Well, one of the changes for all of us at some level, or at least many of us, I shouldn't say all of us, because they're definitely, it's noteworthy how many people's work did, could not change, mm -hmm. did not change 
during the mm-hmm. pandemic. Those people, those essential workers who kept us fed and mm-hmm. and are going through this whole thing. But what are the implications, Jen, of working from home on the popular wisdom from productivity and time management? Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, the first thing is, is that productivity and time management advice is very individualist. You know, it just sort of assumes this kind of life without any contingency. Um, and so I ta- I get a little grumpy in the book about some various sources of that. Um, usually, truthfully, to be honest, male sources, you know, who kind of like get this life um, because was it they five go to the o'clock? office. I think it was. I think it was what you said about, and the, and what you need to do is always go work out at five o'clock yeah, when you're done. Exactly five p.m. <laughs> and I'm like, um, who's making dinner? Who's monitoring homework? I mean, if, again, if you have children, so yeah, I did get a little bit grumpy about that. So, and you know, it's just the pandemic all of a sudden just returned us to a very contingent way of living. Like, oh my goodness, all of a sudden, you know, again, not for everyone, and I certainly don't want to. Assume that, but for me, and certainly for my husband, who was one of those people who did enjoy a fair degree of autonomy. You know, I go to the office. You know, I have um, a partner who generally is managing things at home, and so um, he was suddenly home, and that means that you're home, and you're you know, you've got kids kids underfoot, and people that need to be fed, and you've got computers that aren't working for virtual schooling, and I can't work, on, I can't do that. So all of a sudden, my husband's kind of called in to do that. And so I think that was the first thing that kind of shifted is that we started to realize that we're living very collectively. And so an individual kind of ethos, just it just doesn't work. And, and not to mention that it's it's not very biblical. Um, so just embracing a contingent life. And then this whole idea, too, that I think time management is is very... It assumes the kind of hero of the story that you get to perform these heroic acts. You know, you multiply your minutes, you squeeze, you know, productivity from this limited resource called time. And so at the center of that story is this hero. And to live very heroically means that you always have to be in good health. You know, you're always getting a a decent amount of sleep. And so um, to realize that we don't get the um, perfect ideal conditions of time management most of the time. And certainly in the pandemic, we didn't get them. Yeah. Well, I guess in the, related to that point then, Jen, is my next question. You write that our to-do lists hedge against mortality. Mm-hmm. Expand on that. On that concept, yeah, I mean that was a that was actually I think um, a realization from a couple of people who were um, coding a productivity app, and they were just sort of realizing like people just they they people love to have to do lists, but when you really dig into it, the fact is is that people are never getting the things done on their to do list, and so there's there's this aspirational quality about to do lists, and why are we so aspirational? It's because we are faced all the time with the shadow lurking of our own mortality that we're never going to get everything done and our lives are so brief and of course this is such a beautiful thing that the biblical writers have given to us they've already given us these images of life as a mist a vapor a shadow you know a uh, grass that blooms and flowers that bloom in the morning and wither by the afternoon um and so that is what is happening so often with time management is And I think I I want to credit Oliver Berkman here, too, who's not a Christian writer, a British writer who wrote another time management book that really he, I think, like me, walked a very parallel journey, um, believing in the promises of time management and then suddenly realizing, wait, Mm. wait, this actually doesn't work. (laughs) And, and, And what is this really about? This is really about his book is called 4,000 Weeks. This is really about the fact that we have 4,000 weeks, and that's not very much time. Well, I, I could relate to this, Jen, from the book. You say, I wanted motion because mm. I had always counted motion as meaning. Mm-hmm. And later you write, Who can slow down when there is so much to prove? Mm-hmm. And I'm betting some folks listening here can relate to. It's a bit of a softball question, but if meaning is not found in busyness, where is it found? Yeah. I mean, 
I think there's a lot of monastic wisdom here that I found to be kind of an important answer to this question. And this idea that getting busy with the wrong things is, is, is not what God's calling us to do. Getting busy with the things that God's called us to do. And sometimes he's just not even calling us to be busy. You know, he, it, busyness is a measure of what you get done. Um, or maybe the fact that you have a lot to get done, but it actually says nothing for the quality of your own obedient obedience. Um, are you getting the right things done? And not only are you getting the right things done, but are you getting them done with the right heart and attitude? Um, you know, I talk a lot about irritability in the book um, because I think productivity, again, just that urgency of like, I've got to get things done and please don't get in my way because there is so much to prove and I'm going to have to feel good at the end of this day by having gotten a lot of things done. And just that idea can often just make us so irritable. So where is meaning found? I mean, I look at Jesus. I look at the vocational, obedient response of Jesus. Here I am. You know, I've come to do your will. Your law is written in my heart, on my heart. This is what I delight to do. And so we find the meaning of our lives when we're just we're just responding obediently to God's calling to each of us. Uh, I think this is related then to the concept of higher time that you describe. Mm -hmm. Could you explain what you mean by higher time? Yeah, I've had, I've actually had a really interesting email exchange with another writer on this who wrote about Kairos versus Kronos. And, you know, we do have these two different words in Greek, um, Kairos being the kinds of time that you can't measure with the clock. This idea that there's a time that exists that really does suggest an eternal frame. Um, whereas Kronos is really just those, those minutes, those those hours. It's the time that elapses, the time that can be counted and measured. And so, in this email exchange with another writer, um, you know, we were just talking a little bit, how do we make sense of the fact that while Kairos is a lost time today, in terms of like, if you look at productivity and time management, the time management literature, they're not granting Kairos time generally. They're thinking purely in chronos time. They're thinking about, you've got so many minutes and hours, you got to make use of them today. Um, but, but in the Bible, when we talk even about time in the New Testament, it's not as if the only time that's baptized as good is Kairos time, you know, that Jesus came in Kronos time. And so the words are very, um, they're not systematically used in the New Testament, which is what I was talking to this other writer about. So I think there's this invitation for us as Christians, one, to recover a completely different kind of time keeping, time measuring, time accounting, Kairos time, allowing us to see a life, time that exists beyond the veil of this life. But that isn't to say that God isn't very much involved in Kronos time, and he very much is, and actually he made it. To look at the Genesis account is to see that God made time and said it was good, and that Jesus came in time, and yet suffered I think under Chronos time. I mean, that's what we know about Chronos time is that there is an expiration date that we only get so many hours in this life. And so I think I, I'd be curious. I'm not a New Testament, I'm not a Greek scholar, not a New Testament scholar. So I think these are probably best left to people who know more than me. But um, I'm very interested for Christians to recover. Kairos time, higher time, time that exists beyond just the minute, the hour, the day, the week, the year. Yeah, you've already alluded to this, Jen, but um, the time management and productivity literature tend to assume a certain level of physical and mental ability. One of the things you write, though, is that suffering has a way of eroding all our pieties and platitudes. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us more about how caring for your mother has changed your perspective on what you can or should accomplish? Mm -hmm. So, as I mentioned, during the pandemic was just this real, this 
realization, sobering realization that really all of life is can- contingent. And that one of the things that God is calling all human beings to do is to care diligently for their neighbor. And that is not just, you know, the starving child in another part of the world, you know, as so often we think. I think you know, social media and the digital landscape often forces us to think about the furthest person sometimes and not the closest person in terms of who is my neighbor? Who am I called to care for? And one of the things I realized in the pandemic was that that my neighbor was actually going to become my own mother. So we didn't see her for the first 18 months of the pandemic because of um, the international border between the Canada, Canada and the United States being closed, us being in Toronto, she being in um, in Ohio. And when we saw her for the first time is when I realized I we're going to have to have, we're going to have to think seriously about the next season of life. She was at the time still married to a man who was uh, suffering from Parkinson's and he actually has since passed away. Um, but we knew that that would be imminent and we knew that there really wouldn't be, that there needed to be a plan in place. And it was interesting because after that visit coming home and just in my Bible reading, very sort of serendipitously, I'm reading all the Proverbs. I mean, I don't think you can actually miss them in Proverbs, you know, all the Proverbs that say, you know, honor your parents, care for them when they're older, don't despise them. And so we made the decision to move from Toronto back to Ohio. My mom, we've moved my mom close to us. She's eight minutes away. And it's changed my, the landscape of my life dramatically because I'm the one who takes her to doctor's appointments. I'm the one who now is, has assumed um, kind of all the administrative paperwork for her life, the financial, um, you know, paying her bills, looking at the accounts, all of that. I mean, if she needs anything, she pretty much I'm the one that she's texting. And it's it's not easy. I think specifically because, well, first of all, like I want to get things done, right? Unlike anybody else. I don't want to necessarily have an interrupted life. I think the other challenge about it is, is that I haven't necessarily had um, a, a close relationship with my mother. And so this is actually drawing close to someone who is maybe for me more difficult to draw close to. And so it's now about trusting God. And I think this is the, the thing that I'm really realizing. Productivity so often tells you to make time, multiply time by your own efforts. Whereas I'm trying to now live a way of time where I'm receiving time, where I'm trusting God for the time that's necessary to do the work that he's called me to do. At this stage of my life, it's now not just caring for my mother, continuing to care for my children, you know, being present as a neighbor in a new community, but continuing the work of writing. How all of that's supposed to fit together, (laughs) I don't exactly know, (laughs) but I'm trusting. (laughs) Now, it's easy to see that with all these responsibilities we have, technology makes us more productive, but it also gives us more work to do. Mm -hmm. Without certain technological developments, we wouldn't be able to have this discussion. How do you find wisdom for making technology work for us, not us for the technology? I think one of the things that is so often omitted in a discussion of technology is how it forms our desires. And maybe you're not surprised to hear me talk about desire because that's something that I've, you know, I've I've written about. Um, but I think for for example, one of the things when we think about technology, it forms in us not just a desire for speed, which in and of itself is something that we should pay attention to. You know, that the fact that we become so um, accustomed to, accommodated to moving through the world f- quickly. And so we become irritable when anything sort of impedes us getting thing, something done quickly. But it's not just quickly, it's also effortlessly. It's as it, the technology forms in us a desire for a, a life without burdens. And I think that's something that's really, really important. I think it's how do we deal with um, the technical kind of technological environment? Well, I think one of the things we have to do is just proactively practice other things, practice slow things. And I think we have to practice burdens, burdened ways of living, you know, where we take up caring for somebody. I talked about this too in the book too, that I have um, had a longstanding friendship with someone who is, um, 
you know, as James would say, um, and the, uh, the apostle James would talk about the widow and the orphan, you know, she's the widow and her children are the orphan. Um, but it was really during the pandemic where it was like, oh my gosh, James doesn't just say like, pray for them, give them money, you know, call them occasionally. He says to visit them. <laughs> and that kind of, that is, that is something very interruptive. Um, you know, it's, it's, and so as Christians, how do we take up ways of living where we actually m- take up meaningful burdens um, for love of God and love of neighbor? I mean, I think that is one way we sort of counter the seduction of technology. A few more questions here with Jen Michelle talking about In Good Time, her new book with Baker. Uh, you've already alluded to this a little bit, Jen, but I love your perspective on waiting. And you write that endurance is an expression of faithful waiting. It requires remembering Mm -hmm. the real length of God's time. What helps you remember to live by God's time so that you can endure what you're going through at that time? I I would say... I have to rehearse the the story that scripture is telling. And I, and I do that. I do do that in the quiet of the morning when I just open up, not just, you know, some uh, devotional book, which is great, but really committing to reading the scripture from Genesis to Revelation every year. That just has been a practice for me for a long, long time. And I think that just to see that story again and again and again, it remind like it just takes me out of like this immediate sort of circumstance of my own life, lifts my eyes to the mountains, reminds me that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, you know, before the mountains were ever formed, you are God. Um, so we can't have the wisdom to number our days aright um, unless we tell that story. But I don't think we just um, learn to tell that story, rehearse that story in the quiet of our home. I think we have to do it in church. Um, I think that week after week after week after week, we do have to show up in the community of believers and just hear that story told again and again and again and again. Um, Because I don't know how you feel, Colin, but I certainly feel my own heart to be like a sieve, you know, where the truths just sort of like... Just every day, like they don't I, don't, I never stay fully filled up with the truth of the story of time. Um, so those are a couple of the ways that I think for me, I'm learning to tell a different story, different than, you know, I better get things done and I better prove something with my life. And oh my gosh, time is so scarce. On the one hand, it is. And on the other hand, it's not. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah, I mean, is that Is that basically the same way you'd answer the question of what helps you slow down and find perspective and enjoy Jesus? I I have a lot of respect and admiration for my friends and family members who seem to do this well. I am not one of them. So I'm eager for that. Uh, I, I experience Christ most through actions, but that tends to, and, and through other people, But that tends to lend itself toward a lot of the productivity idolatry also. Mm -hmm. A lot of the working for Jesus rather than, say, with Jesus um, or from Jesus, uh, Mm. to use all these different prepositions. But um, So what is it that helps you slow down and find perspectives and, and enjoy Jesus if you haven't covered that already? Yeah, well, it's interesting because um, just over the last couple of months, like it, from a variety of different sources, and you know, that's kind of you, when you know when God's speaking to you because you hear yeah. the same thing from that's about point. 18 different sources, and <laughs> it really has been enjoy Jesus, just enjoying his presence, you know, so an example would be um, our pastor mentioned John Flavel, a Puritan writer and his book, Keeping the Heart. And he was talking about the spiritual practice of keeping the heart and the purpose of it being our sweet and free communion with Christ. And I thought, oh, wow, that idea of just enjoying sweet and free communion with Christ 
I don't know much about that. And another book was talking about, you know, just the practice of solitude, you know, that actually even in our times with the Lord, often they can be very productivity driven, you know, reading the right kinds of things and praying for through our lists and all of those things are really good. But actually beginning a time with Jesus, that is just that you just enter into that with just quiet silence, you know, even just creating some room for God to speak. Sometimes that's just reading scripture and um, pausing. I've I've actually had to just make that time longer because it just doesn't all fit in. <laughs> um, but I also think it's not just a morning time. I think the practice of, um, again, to sort of return to the monks and the nuns who um, prayed the offices and Christians who throughout the centuries have prayed the hours, different set times throughout the day to return to prayer so that those returnings actually make it possible to experience sweet and free communion with Christ throughout the day. Um, but it's not easy. I mean, I think temperamentally, Colin, you know, you and I are probably very similar. And I think that there is a wonderful way that we've been made. Um, to th- I think there are ways that God uses our temperaments, our type A kind of craziness. But I do think that invitation is important for us, especially I've been thinking about this as in, in the context of caring for my mom, because productivity is not going to be possible the older that we get. You know, we're going to have to practice these things so that when we enter into Lord willing, if God gives us time to age and, you know, become the matriarchs and patriarchs of the faith, like we need to have the capacity to enjoy that with God. Absolutely. Absolutely. That seems to be woven into some of what God does to prepare us for eternity through the Mm -hmm. fallenness of this world and the great Mm -hmm. tragedy of death. Is it it gradually and sometimes then suddenly uh, introduces us to our utter and complete dependence on Christ, whether we like it or not. Um, Last question, uh, Janice, is something that came up just as I was reading your book. I've been surprised by the popularity of certain self-help and productivity books among some, many, Christian women in the last decade. And you write this, that self-help is an industry that enthrones the self, and though this can at times feel empowering, it's ultimately defeating. Your problems are always yours to solve through your efforts and cunning and self-discipline. Self-improvement is an exhausting, thriving business. Mm -hmm. I'd just love for you to maybe recap here as the last answer how you understand your book as a contrast, especially in light of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there's a big tree on the cover of it, which is to figure the person in Psalm 1, this, this flourishing human life that grows its roots down deep into the groundwater of God's love, this person who meditates day and night on, on, on God's words, you know? Um, so first of all, like the self, um, self help is, is again, it's always about your own wisdom, you know, it's about, or maybe it's about the wisdom of that Instagram influencer. Um, and rather than on God's words um, and God himself. So I think that's a huge difference that I think what I'm trying to do in this book is I'm actually trying to whet people's appetite for um, the life that is going to grow deeply and slowly in time. And that's the thing too, is that self-help is, you know, self-help doesn't say, here's a strategy for solving your problems in 20 years. (laughs) It's like, no, I need, I need, I need help now. And I, and I also need you to distill it in about five, you know, quick ways of, um, approaching a problem. And so I think that Psalm one, and interesting to learn that, um, in the, in the Middle Ages, there were a group of women, the Beguines, who, and maybe others who really saw Christ as that man, that blessed man of Psalm one. And so I think the difference between self-help and my book, I hope is going to be pretty apparent because I'm suggesting that 
you're going to have to submit to the practices of wisdom, which mean wisdom, the fear of the Lord, first principle of wisdom, wisdom being a community enterprise. It's not simply that something that you can just sort of think up and it's intergenerational. Um, it's something that you're going to have to look to not just your ancestors, but your, you know, um, your, your elders to learn from. And it's just going to take a lot of time. You don't grow the kind of life, the Psalm 1 life overnight. You don't grow it because, you know, you took a few hacks from TikTok. You grow it incrementally from, from a seed of faith. And, and that fruit of the, of the wise life is not just meant to feed, you know, yourself. You're feeding the world and you're feeding generations to come. Well, my guest has been Jen Michelle talking about her latest book, In Good Time, published by Baker. It wouldn't be appropriate for the 100th episode if I did not run through my <laughs> final three here real quick. Oh, First one I normally ask, Jen, is how do you find calm in the storm? I think that's kind of been what this whole interview has been yeah, about. Yeah, I think so. So I think we've got that one covered. Number two is where do you find good news today? I find good news, I think honestly, in the community of the saints. I believe in the communion of the saints. Um, I love being in relationship with other believers who just remind me, even if I'm not seeing God at work in my own life, I'm always seeing God at work in other people's lives. So I would say that. Yeah. One of my favorite things every week is just to watch everybody go forward for communion. Mm. It's just a lovely thing right mm -hmm. there. Um, and then finally, what's the last great book you've read? This will probably surprise you, but okay. I just finished Dante's Inferno. Okay. All right. I love it so much <laughs> and I want everybody to read it. And now I'm on obviously to the, to Purgatorio. Okay. Um, but Baylor Honors College offers, um, something called a hundred days with Dante and they will send you email reminders or you can get it a variety of other ways. Um, and lectures, free lectures that are like, seven, eight, 10 minutes long to help you understand um, each of the cantos. So I've had help reading it. And I think because I've helped reading, have had help reading it, I have enjoyed it just immensely. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That, you are the first. You're the first. A <laughs> hundred episodes in and you are the first to mention Okay. Dante. Well, yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but I love it. I love hearing that. Um, again, my guest, on this 100th episode of Gospel Bound has been Jen Pollock michelle Take a look at her book, In Good Time, new from Baker. Jen, thank you so much for uh, this interview, as well as being a big part of the inspiration behind this podcast to begin with. Yeah, you're welcome, Colin. 